Uh, the second uh, presentation is by Mr. Mark Dudovic. Dubovic, sorry. Dubovic. Dubovic. American Dubowitz. Dubowitz. Israeli Dubovic. <laughs> Dubovic. Uh, Israeli Ben Dubo. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Yeah, I think he is Canadian at the end, so <laughs> his English is peculiar, he's Canadian. He's Canadian? Yes, yeah, so his English is not so, you know. <laughs> that's, very, that's not how, nice, How eh? is it said in, in, in Canadian Indian? It, it's it's Dubowitz A. Dubowitz A. <laughs> uh, in Poland, Dubovic. Uh, change the name, it will be easier. Exactly. You can read his bio in the program, <laughs> nevertheless, I'll present him. Mr. Dubovic is ex executive director of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, a Washington-based nonpartisan policy institute where he leads projects on Iran, sanctions, and non-proliferation. I emphasize sanctions because the, t the subject of the lecture would be focused on sanctions. If Please. I may say, very influential um, institute in Washington. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Great. Can everybody hear me okay? So first of all, thank you, uh, Yair, for that introduction. And, and Shimon and General Amador, are a real honor to be here. Emily, thank you for your uh, invitation. And certainly, uh, we all pay a lot of attention to what INSS says in Washington. Um, incredibly influential voice in this debate, and uh, I eagerly await every report that you put out on Iran uh, to see whether I'm at least close to what you're saying uh, and, not, and not at risk of embarrassing myself. I want to actually pick up on this uh, bizarre analogy that uh, General Amador talked about, because I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm the only guy wearing a suit and tie. Okay, so I'm the guy that goes to the shuk in a suit and tie, and I say to the vendor, hi there, my name is Mark Dubowitz and I'm from Washington and my plane is leaving in an hour. And my wife has told me under the pain of divorce that unless I come back to Washington with one of your beautiful handmade rugs, she is gonna be very, very angry. But let me emphasize, I have an hour, I only have an hour to catch my flight. How much for the rug? And my fear is that this is sort of Analogy may be unfair, but I think this, in some respects this negotiation dynamic between the P5 plus one and the Iranians has sort of followed this kind of um, very, very deeply concerning dynamic where the Americans, as General Amidor in particular, have seemed more desperate. Artificial timelines have been imposed by the Americans, by P5 plus one, by the way, not by Congress. Congress perhaps unwisely believed that by actually threatening new sanctions, the administration would take that threat and actually use that to create additional leverage. Right? That would make sense. But unfortunately, it actually seems to have backfired because what the administration has done is they've bought into the Iranian narrative that new sanctions would lead the Iranians to walk away from the table. And the administration, in fact, has spent much of the past almost two years trying to make the case that new sanctions, new pressure, new leverage would only blow up negotiations, and if there was no deal, the alternative was war. So we are in a situation where this dynamic has been created of the desperate American in the suit and tie with an hour left to buy a rug, and a reluctance on the part of the administration to actually use the leverage that Congress was trying to provide. Now, what, what has been the net result of that? And I want to sort of step back from this and, and maybe get somewhat technical into this, into this deal. Because to me, this deal is, can be defined in many ways, but let me give my best sort of short analysis. This deal to me is a deal about sunsets and snapbacks. And it's fundamentally about the asymmetry, right, the disconnect between an expanding Iranian nuclear program over time and diminishing Western economic leverage, which is exactly the opposite of what you want, right? You want a nuclear program, an Iranian nuclear program, diminishing over time, and you want Western leverage increasing over time. So what do I mean by this? Well, if you were to start these negotiations all over again, 
what key parameter would you want to impose on these negotiations? We've heard a lot about dismantling, we've heard a lot about um, disconnecting, we've heard a lot about verification inspection, but if I were to impose one key parameter, it would be what measure could you use to force the Iranians to make a strategic decision not to pursue a military nuclear program, but to pursue a peaceful nuclear program. And there actually is something out there in international law or in the international construct, which is called the broader conclusion. And the broader conclusion is something the IAEA provides. They've actually provided a broader conclusion to 65 countries. And the broader conclusion essentially says that this nuclear program is only for peaceful purposes. There are no undeclared facilities. There are no undeclared activities. There is no illicit diversion of any equipment or materials for covert means. This program is peaceful. And the IAEA certifies that, and it's done so for 65 countries. Now, rather than link all of these restrictions and provisions to a broader conclusion, right, blessed by the UN Security Council, right, where the Americans would exercise a veto, how was this deal constructed? This deal was constructed through essentially a series of sunset provisions. Now, I want, I want to show you on the slides because this can start getting very technical, but essentially this deal has a series of sunset provisions which over time the restrictions on the program begin to disappear. Some key restrictions disappear after year 10. Most of the restrictions go and disappear after year 15. There are some restrictions that disappear after year 20, year 25. But let me give you a sort of a sense of what these restrictions are. So you, you have a sense of where this nuclear program is going. Now from zero to 10 years, okay, it's, nothing has been dismantled. You know, I looked up the, the definition of dismantle in the dictionary. And dismantle basically means to separate and render inoperable. Right? So essentially, some people think about it as destroy, but it's essentially take something, separate it, break it apart, and render it inoperable. Now, if you look at this nuclear deal, there is nothing in this deal that has been separated and rendered inoperable. And we can talk a little bit more about the specifics, but even the roughly 13, 14,000 centrifuges that are gonna be warehoused are not dismantled. They can be reassembled and made operable. So what you essentially have is a deal that dismantles nothing. But you have restrictions on the program. Between year zero and 10, some pretty good restrictions. The one that is most glaring is that the Iranians are gonna be able to perform R&D on their advanced centrifuges. Right? They'll be able to enrich up to 3.67%. They're gonna be continue to produce centrifuges and, and centrifuge components, and they'll maintain the stockpile of 300 kilograms. Okay, so a constrained nuclear program between year zero and 10. Now after 10 years, the Iranians get to increase the number of operating centrifuges to an unlimited amount at Natanz. They get to oper operationalize an unlimited number of advanced centrifuges, and they get to reduce the breakout time from one year to near zero, according to President Obama, at year 13. Now, some of these provisions are still being negotiated, and perhaps the P5 plus one can get more restrictions on advanced centrifuge R&D, but essentially after year 10, between 10 and 13, the breakout time starts to fall from one year and it starts to fall. Does it fall, is it a hard landing? Does it fall to near zero, like President Obama said by year 13? Or is it a soft landing, where it starts to diminish over time? Regardless, between 10 and 15, that's a period of time where I believe we are all gonna be watching this program with a fair amount of trepidation. It's at year 15 where things get really, really ugly, from our perspective. Because at year 15, the Iranians can build and operate an unlimited number of enrichment facilities. They can install and operate an unlimited number of existing centrifuges and advanced centrifuges. They can enrich uranium at Fordo. Remember the Fordo facility buried under a mountain on a Revolutionary Guard base? Well, after year 15, that becomes a fully operational enrichment facility using advanced centrifuges. They can enrich uranium above 3.67%. They can increase their stockpile of LEU. They can certainly, after year 15, achieve a near zero or undetectable breakout. They can build additional heavy water reactors and accumulate heavy water. In other words, after year 15, you've got an industrial-sized nuclear program 
with an unlimited enrichment capacity, a breakout time of zero, widely dispersed program on a territory more than twice the size of Texas. That's after year 15. Now, there are some permanent restrictions. Uh, spent fuel from the Iraq heavy water reactor has to be shipped out. There's no reprocessing or reprocessing R&D. Iran is going to ratify what's called the additional protocol. IAEA access. We'll go to the next slide. After 20 years, by the way, the IAEA can no longer conduct continuous surveillance of centrifuge component manufacturers. After 25 years, the IAEA can no longer have access to uranium mills and continuous surveillance of uranium uh, mines. What the IAEA can have is permanent access rights that's still yet to be defined. It's one of the big areas of debate. Now, this sounds like a lot of technical detail, but let me sort of sum it up once again. This is an Iranian nuclear program. It starts off not dismantled, it starts off partially constrained, and over time, 10 years, 15 years, this is an Iranian program that gets to expand to an industrial size strength with zero breakout. Again, zero breakout is undetectable breakout. The whole rationale that the administration has advanced for this deal is we're going to move breakout from three months to 12 months because that'll give us enough time to reimpose sanctions or to use military force to forestall an Iranian breakout or sneak out. The problem with that is that even if, and it's a big if, that one year breakout is maintained for the first 10 years, it starts to diminish after year 10. And by year 13, according to President Obama, it's at near zero. A year 15 is at zero. So that's the Iranian nuclear program, expanding over time. Now, the problem is, of course, at year 7, 9, 10, 12, 15, what do you want? You want maximum leverage if you're the P5 plus 1. You want to be able to respond to Iranian non-compliance, to Iranian stonewalling of the IAEA, or an Iranian sneak out, or more likely an inch out, right, by having maximum leverage. What are the three forms of leverage that you're going to have? There's diplomatic leverage, right, where you can demarche the Iranians, affectionately known, I think, Shimon, you probably know this in, in diplomatic speak as a demarche mellow, right? Because that's not going to have much effect. You can, um, you can bomb the Iranians, but of course the problem with bombing the Iranians is it would have to be an egregious violation. The Iranians would have to throw out inspectors or you would have to detect a breakout or sneak out in order to justify the military force. Because I can't imagine, and there's a number of Americans in the audience, you can't imagine your president calling a nine o'clock press conference and saying, my fellow Americans, the US intelligence community has detected that the Iranians are feeding uranium hexafluoride into an IR-8 at Fordo in violation of this agreement. I've ordered the US military and US Air Force to commence military strikes on Iran's nuclear facilities. God bless America. And the Iranians are smart because the Iranians don't cheat egregiously. They cheat incrementally. Even though the sum total of their incremental cheating is always egregious. But they cheat incrementally. And so you can't respond to incremental cheating by using military force. So, th so then what are you left with? Well, what you're left with, according to the administration, is economic leverage. If the Iranians cheat, if they try to inch out, or if they begin to free themselves as these constraints begin to disappear after year 10 and year 15, we will, quote unquote, as President Obama said, come down on Iran like a ton of bricks. Okay? We will force serious, severe, crippling economic pain. Okay. So let's, let's look at that proposition. Because this deal, as I understand it, will in require significant sanctions relief. There'll be a big debate about whether that sanctions relief will be upfront, as the Khamenei has wanted. Will it be phased over time, calibrated to nuclear compliance? But at the end of the day, if you go out two, three, four years, however this deal is structured, you have essentially given Iran significant, perhaps massive sanctions relief. The Iranian economy will be begin to recover, as it has recovered during the interim agreement stage. The Iranian economy's resilience will harden. International companies will go back into Iran, slowly at first, right, as they figure out the legalities 
and the uh, constraints and the conditions of the Iranian economy and their counterparties, but more quickly, after a few years, with tens of billions of dollars invested in the Iranian economy, with energy companies and financial institutions back in, Iran will become integrated with a global financial and economic community. I mean, indeed, that's President Obama's main selling proposition. Right? We will economically seduce the regime and we will flood billions of dollars back in. Okay. Problem is, is that the administration has devised something called the snapback sanction. Now, the snapback sanction is a very interesting proposition. The snack bank sanction says we will suspend all these sanctions over time. In some cases, we will terminate the sanctions over time. But if we catch Iran violating the agreement, right, and we will define the violations in some way, we will snap back these sanctions. We will inflict economic pain, and the Iranians will be forced back into compliance. Now, to believe that, you have to believe a few things. First of all, you have to believe that when you start to snap back the sanctions, the Iranian economy is still fragile enough that there will be an asymmetric economic shock to the economy sufficient to force enough economic pain for Iran to comply. Right? That was the period of time between 2010 and 2013 when a rolling range of sanctions every three months or so kept slamming into the Iranian economy, their central bank, their oil exports, they were de-swifted. Their, their, their banks were sanctioned, their sectors of their economy were sanctioned, and it created enormous economic pain to a very fragile economy. Fast forward 10 years, 15 years, it's a hardened economy. It is, the Iranians have spent money building up resilience. They're not stupid. They're not gonna spend all their money on economic growth. They're gonna build up their foreign exchange reserves. They're gonna build up their rainy day fund. They wanna put themselves in a position so that if the sanctions do snap back, they will be increasingly immunized against that economic pressure. The other thing is, and, and this is what gives me most concern, is when we snap back those sanctions, who are we snapping back sanctions against? Well, ultimately, which companies are gonna go back into Iran over time? There will be Chinese companies, Russian companies, Indian companies, fine. But there will be European companies. So we will have to be in complete agreement with our European allies all the way through for the next 15 years and do a coordinated snapback, or we will be snapping back sanctions against the Europeans. Now, under existing EU law, US secondary sanctions are actually illegal. Their, US, their European companies do not have to comply with US secondary sanctions. Europe has not complied with US secondary sanctions, it's built its own sanctions regime. That entire sanctions regime is getting dismantled. So we will be snapping back sanctions against the Germans and the French and the Italians and the Brits. And you may say, it won't happen. We will always be coordinated. And I'd, I'd like to maybe end with this note. And that is to remind you of the years, the two or three years before the invasion of Iraq. The two or three years before the invasion of Iraq, Jacques Chirac was the president of France. Gerhard Schroeder was the chancellor of Germany. And George W. Bush was the president of the United States. From my recollection, the three men did not get along very well. From my recollection, the Germans, and the French, in particular, were engaged in egregious sanctions busting with Saddam. Okay, you remember the oil for food program? That was the culmination of a <clears throat> massive sanctions busting program that had started years earlier. So imagine 15 years forward, you have Gerhard Schroeder, the second coming of Gerhard Schroeder instead of Angela Merkel in Berlin. You have uh, Marie Le Pen as president of France instead of Francois Hollande and you have another Bush in the White House. And the United States decides we're gonna snap back sanctions against our European allies. You have the recipe for what I am deeply concerned about, which is serious transatlantic divisions. And if you don't think that's Iranian strategy, then you haven't read Rouhani's book, and you haven't read Zarif's book, because they talk about exactly that. It's a divide and conquer strategy. Divide the Americans from the Europeans, divide the Europeans from themselves, divide the West from Asia. They've talked about this negotiating strategy. I hope John Kerry has read their books. Thank you. By the, by the way, technically, if the Europeans are lifting the sanctions to put it again, 
they need all the 28 members of the European Union to agree. I don't believe that that will happen in the future. Well, it happened as a matter of fact. Yes, it I happened in the, in the yeah. past, yes. Yeah. Will it happen in the future? Well, the future is no Apparently longer what, what it used to be. <laughs> uh, 